We're live. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Fly Tying Monday. I'm going to wait and um, and till we get a quorum here. See how many see how many people come in on this uh, on this holiday holiday week. Kind of a holiday week for some people, anyway. Except for people in Buffalo, I guess it's not exactly a holiday for them. Um, and I grew up in Rochester, not far from Buffalo, so I know what those lake effect storms are like. They are they are no fun. Um, I have bad news for you. Julia is on PTO this week, so no Julia. We have Tanner in the background, and Tanner will be uh, reading your questions to me uh, as we tie. And, you know, I just want to I just want to welcome um, anyone who has never been here for one of our Monday Fly Tying uh, sessions. We have a lot of fun. You're welcome to tease me. You're welcome to give me grief if you want. Uh, don't hold back. And, you know, um, while we're here, while we're all here together, this is your opportunity to ask questions because it's live. And so um, I can answer your questions here in real time uh, about about this. You know, let's we'll try to keep it to what we're doing today. But if, you know, if you have some general fly tying questions, um, this uh, this fly we're going to tie today, it's not not terribly difficult. Um, I tied an easy one last week. I'm going to tie an easy one this week. I'm not going to make it so easy on you uh, next month. Uh, it, it's time to do something. A little more complicated, so we'll get we'll get to some we'll get to some tougher flies. But um, you know, this is another nymph that we're going to tie today, and uh, you know we all need nymphs for the winter time because uh, your fly boxes are are probably depleted from the spring and summer and fall seasons. I don't know about you, but I, I lose a lot of nymphs, and my my boxes get skinnier and skinnier as the season goes on. And uh, you know, if you're going to fish during the winter. Uh, it's going to be mostly nymph fishing unless you're going to South America. Like me, I'm going to South America. I'm going to Chile. I'm going to Chile on Friday and I will be uh, doing some filming and I will be gone for uh, 10 days. So we won't have, uh, won't have uh, fly tying for a couple weeks. I am going to load up a couple podcasts though. So you will have podcast your podcasts on Friday. Um, but I, I won't be here to do this live and I'm not going to do it from Chile because we don't have good uh, internet down there. So anyway, um, the fly we are going to tie today is Lance Egan's Rainbow Warrior. And like last week's fly, it's a really bright fly. It's even brighter than the nymph we tied last week, but I think there's a I think there's a real place for um, for bright flies like this in your fly box. And I don't know I don't know exactly why fish take such a flashy fly. I and mean, there's a, there a couple things a couple things to consider. One is that um, is that fish do um, develop gas bubbles and uh, I, I just learned this morning how those gas bubbles form from Rick Hayfley, who I did a podcast with. We had a follow-up question. It's kind of interesting that um, the the there's a there's a nymph inside the nymph. There's a nymph skin, but then there's an, an adult skin, two exoskeletons that are it's, they're about to they're about to emerge. And sorry about the dog barking. I have an older dog who barks at the UPS man. And I have a, a young do, young puppy who's in the kennel right now with nobody home. So you may hear a lot of noise. Anyway, there's two skins inside that, inside that nymph case. And right before the flies hatch, the two skins separate. The, uh, the inner exoskeleton separates from the outer exoskeleton. And it leaves... It leaves a little uh, gap in there, and that gap fills with air or fills with gas, and that is what allows the the nymph to rise to the surface. And also, the pressure inside there uh, allows the nymph to split that exoskeleton, that outer exoskeleton, and then climb out into the um, into the terrestrial world, uh, into the air. So, um, 
they do have gas bubbles. The other thing is that a fly that is this bright, um, I think it takes on this reflective. I think it, it will take on the color of the background often when it when it's underwater. And it, when we hold this fly, we'll take a look at it here. When we hold this fly in front of us, it looks pretty darn flashy, the Rainbow Warrior. Um, but when it's underwater, there's a good chance that the fly, the, this reflective stuff is going to reflect the color of uh, this, the surrounding bottom or weeds or whatever there are in there. Uh, so it, it probably doesn't look as flashy to the fish as it does to us out of the water. The other thing is that it, it may just attract a fish's attention. It, it will flash and sparkle and it may just attract their attention. And then they see that, well, maybe it doesn't have the same color as a nymph, but it has the same shape. So I think I'm going to eat it anyway. So there's a couple. There's, there's a few uh, wild theories, but, but these flies do work and, uh, and they do work quite well. And they, they sometimes work in, in, in bright, on bright days and in bright sunlight and in clear water. And uh, other times they're good in dirty water. But um, anyway, this is a very successful, very popular fly. And uh, I was reading about uh, how Lance Egan developed it. Lance Egan is an is a awesome angler and um, educator from Utah. And he tied a bunch of these things and he put them in his box. He tied them at home, just, you know, dreaming something up. And he, he put them in his box and he promptly forgot about them. Every time he opened up, he looked at them. He said, nah, they're too, too bright, too flashy. And then one day he decided to eh, just put one on and try it. And it really, really worked well. It outperformed the other flies that he had tried. And since then it's become a go-to fly for him. And I think that that anyone that's that is a is a fly developer, a fly designer, has had this experience where you, you tie something, it looks kind of cool, then you forget about it, or you don't have the nerve to try it, and then you try it one day, and usually it doesn't work at all. But uh, occasionally you come up you come up with a winner. So that's how that's how Lance uh, developed the Rainbow Warrior. Um. Anyway. Do we have any questions at this point before I start? I don't think so. Marcy, you are first time here. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. I don't see anybody else that's that's a first time person, but um, I don't know. Oh, John's from watching from Buffalo. Needs a break from snow blowing. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet you do. Uh, Randy, yes, the videos are available after the live session. They're they're on. They'll be on YouTube, archived on YouTube, and on the Orvis uh, on the Orvis Facebook page. So they'll be they'll be available in both places. And Randy is also first time from North Carolina. Welcome, Randy. Okay. Soon asks, the bead is nickel tungsten bead. Can anything else be used? Yes, anything. Any color bead can be used soon, um, but it won't be a rainbow warrior. It'll be soon's warrior. Um, but this uh, this is, you know, I, I, I generally don't mess with patterns. Um, if, I, if I have to substitute, I can, but I generally don't... Um, I don't substitute if, if somebody recommends a particular color bead. All right. So let's start, and I'm just going to hang on a second. Sorry about that. Okay. So we're going to put a going to put a hook in the vise. And I'm going to put this hook in a funny way. I'll show you why. I'm going to start with the hook in the vise like this. The reason is that the I'm using a uh, wide gape barbless tactical hook. It's short shank, very sharp, uh, really good holding hook 
for for a barbless hook. Um, but it's hard to get the bead on these. This is a size 12, which is really a size 14 fly because these are fairly short shank. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this handy bead uh, bead dispenser. And I've got a I've got a few different colors of beads on here. But what you do is you, of course, you have to thread these on the dispenser first. Uh, what you do is you slide a bead up and you kind of lock it on this outside piece of wire here. The rest of the beads are just going to stay on the, on the thing. And then you bring that over to your hook. And this allows you to kind of line it up with the point. If I can do it here this far from the camera. Line it up with the point, and usually you can slide the bead right on the hook, like so. Now I can take that bead and slide it up to the head, and now I'm all set. So if you're having trouble, if you're having trouble uh, putting putting beads on the hook. This is, uh, this is a pretty handy little tool, and it works particularly well with the really small, small hooks. Um, I have uh, an eighth inch uh, nickel, nickel colored bead because that's what the pattern calls for. If you were going to tie a, you know, a, a slightly smaller, like a 14, you'd probably want a, a 7 16 inch bead, 14 or a 16. But on this, I can put an eighth inch bead on this size 12 hook. And I'm going to use red thread. I happen to be using 12-0. I don't need to go this fine. Uh, but those of you who watch my tying know I like to use a really fine thread. This, is, this thread is plenty strong. And... It's going to give it a little red hot spot. And I generally tr try to wind enough thread so that bead stops moving so it doesn't get in the way. Any questions so far, Tanner? No? Okay. All right. So the tail on this is pheasant tail, which I neglected to bring over to my camera pheasant tail and i'm going to take like four or five fibers let's find some that are not bunged up here yeah this looks like a good bunch here and just pluck them from the stem and then i like the tails on a nymph like this fairly short. So I'm going to line this up so that it's, you know, maybe like two thirds of a shank length or something long. And I'm just going to hold it there where I want it. And then I'm going to come over and catch the pheasant tail. And as I wind back, I'm going to pull the pheasant tails up and a little bit toward me so that they stay. And it, stay on top of the shank and i'm going to go down the shank a little bit so that this fly has a has a curved shape uh in the end because uh, nymphs often have a kind of a curved shape when they're when they're hatching and i'll just cut this off don't need to cut it off too short because you want to kind of you want to kind of uh jam stuff up into this bead so that it doesn't slip back over the fly when you're done. Questions? One question, Tom. Where did you get yeah. that uh, nifty bead threading tool? It is made by Hairline. And uh, you can't buy directly from Hairline. There's a whole, they're a wholesaler, but any, any fly shop that sells Hairline products will probably have them. I know that Orvis is planning on it. I don't think we have it. 
I don't think we have it in our offering yet, but Orvis is planning on um, on selling these. But I did get it from Hairline. Do you see it, Tanner, on the offering? It would be under the new stuff. No? I'm looking now. I don't see it yet. Yeah. Okay. But it is available. Any place that sells Hairline. I'm sure if you go online and just Google, uh, you know, bead, bead threading tool, you can find it. Then I'm going to take some, uh, this opalescent tinsel. And this is, I'm going to use a size large. Now, normally, you wouldn't use a size large for this fly. However... Um, this is going to be both my body and my wing case. So you're going to you, you're going to want to use a wider a wider piece than normal. And I would use this size large in this particular pattern uh, for size 12, 14. And then if you go down to a 16 or an 18, you probably want to use the size medium um, opalescent tinsel. You could pr you could probably use uh, you could. Probably use a few strands of flashaboo or something if you want, but this gives it a very distinctive look. And then I'm going to come back up to the front of the fly. And as I do, I think I'm going to wind some thread in here just to give the body a little taper. So I'm going to go back and forth but not go all the way to the tail so that I, I give myself a little bit of a taper there. Then I'm going to go all the way up to the bead and just grab this piece of tinsel with the thread and then wind back. Just even turns. You don't have to cover every single turn of that. So you got this big wide piece of tinsel on the back. I might go back one more. Okay. And then I'm going to wind back up to about a third of the way back on the shank. Now this first turn of tinsel is important. You need to hold your tail in place and pull on the tinsel so that it, you get a nice smooth start. And then that won't, that won't cant the tail off to the side. And when you wrap this wide tinsel, you want to just, you want to just overlap, you want to overlap half of the turn before so that you get, get a little bit of segmentation in there. If I didn't do that, I wouldn't get much of a segmentation. Now when you get up to here, you tie it off with a couple turns. And then you just fold this back flat and on top of the hook. And just take a couple turns, not back over it very much, but just to hold it in place so that it so that it's going to come over the top, straight over the top when you're done. You can tweak it a little bit to get it to sit right so there's your tinsel body and that's going to be the wing case as well and then the thorax for this fly is specific a specific type of dubbing it's this wopsy sow scud material and it's called Rainbow Tan, Tan Rainbow. And again, Wopsy does not sell direct, but it's it's something you'll find in in most fly shops. And if you and every pattern that I looked up online called for this specific dubbing. And if you don't have Wopsy Sow Scud Rainbow Tan like that what you can do is what i do to make this mix is i take some i take some uh 
soft, like super fine or rabbit fur, but a tan, a soft tan fur. And I use that for my base. And then I throw in a few strands of orange, a few strands of yellow, a few strands of red, and a few strands of blue. Because those are the colors that when I look at this, this mix, I can see in the blend. And here, so here's a blend that I made myself, a little bit darker a little bit darker than the uh, the Wopsy blend, but it'll work just fine. And you just have to uh, you just have to keep mixing mixing this until all the fibers get fairly mixed up. Put it in a coffee grinder, or you can just mix it by hand. So now I've made my own rainbow tan dubbing there, and it's got all hey, these. Do yeah. Roger Bird asks, could you wrap the tinsel using the rotary feature? Yeah, you could. But then you have to park, then you have to park your bobbin on a bobbin rest and and then you have to unpark it. I, I'm lazy. I'm lazy. But yes, you could definitely wrap the tinsel using the rotary feature. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I'll show you a little closer. Let's see if I can get this dubbing in focus a little bit better there. Yeah, there's the there's the rainbow effect. So whether this is absolutely necessary, I have no idea. But that's what the pattern calls for. And it's a very deadly pattern. So I'm going to use what the recipe recommended. So I'm just going to take a little bit of this stuff here for my thorax. And I'm going to dub a non-tapered noodle, relatively thick, not super thick, but relatively thick. You probably can't see it there. And You may, you may have too much. You might have to remove some. You may not have enough. You might have to add some. That's okay. That's how it goes with dubbing. And then I'm just going to tightly wind this thorax in place. And I'll come up to the bead. And I'll come back a little bit and overlap. Get a, you know, get a, get a little bit of a bulky thorax there. Well, that's it. Just a simple dubbing. And then pull that wing case over the top, hold it in place, and tie it down with a couple firm turns. And then this is the only real tricky part in this fly. I'll turn it your way a little bit so you can see it better and focus it. Um, This, this wing case tends to pull out. It's the weakest point of the fly. So what you want to do is, is spin your thread counterclockwise so it jumps back. And then just scooch that extra piece of tinsel forward a bit and come down on top of it. That's going to that's gonna bind that tinsel on top of there and then keep winding until you fill all that space in there because you want a little bit of a red hot spot in the front and i'm using this really fine thread so i have to wind quite a bit just want a little bit of a red hot spot there and then take your scissors and snip that off. And there's your rainbow warrior. Oh, you got a whip finish. How could I forget the whip finish? And that's it. And then, um, 
probably want to put some head cement in there. I really like this uh, water-based head cement. It's very thin, very, very thin, thinner than any of the other head cements you'll use. And it's water-based, which makes it easy to thin if you have to. Um, but it really soaks in. It'll seal the threads just fine. It's white when it first goes on, but it's going to dry clear. And I'm going to answer two questions before they're asked. Yes, you could tie this on a jig hook if you want. And yes, you could put some UV cure epoxy over the tinsel. I don't because it makes the body too fat. And that wide tinsel is, is fairly durable. Uh, but yes, you could do both of those things. And I know somebody's going to ask that. So there is a very simple and you got a few stray hair straggly hairs there you can hairs there you can either trim them or pluck them out or you could you could cut them with your scissors or you could actually brush this out a little bit if you wanted to but i think i think it's just about right the way it is there so that is uh, the rainbow warrior very straightforward simple fly and you know if you if you want a uh, if you want a bright fly in your fly box, this is the one to use. You fish this, fish this dry dropper, fish this under an indicator, fish this Euro nymph style. You can fish it any way your little heart desires. All right, questions. It's not a glass bead, Jacob. It's a it's a uh, nickel colored tungsten bead. Could use a glass bead if you want to. It just wouldn't sink as well. Great fly in Colorado in the summertime. Thank you, Colorado fly fish. I think it's great fly anywhere. I'm going to use them in Chile when I'm down there next week. Yep. Tell her you how know. It a couple other questions um okay a little bit earlier okay. all right you want me to go back and look at them Let's see if i can find them oh lots of questions uh i notice you don't use much head cement or super glue i'm thinking i use too much what's your philosophy about using head cement you know judge too good if you have a good whip finish and and you touch it with head cement and your your uh, bot your materials are durable you don't need a lot of head cement or super glue there's certain places um that you need super glue you know i've been tying a bunch of foam body dry flies and you definitely want to put some super glue both on the uh on the hook once it's covered with thread before you put the foam down so it doesn't rotate and there are there you know there are places where super glue is definitely useful but um you don't really need too much um, coming from a, a commercial fly tying background, one of one of my uh, bugaboos is is not to have to stop uh, and uh, and apply something in the middle of tying a fly. So, I, I'm, you know, I don't I don't use a lot of super glue or glue in general. Uh, but you know, I find that sometimes I don't even put head cement on my on my flies. They will fall apart a little bit uh, quicker. If you don't put head cement on the threads, that's that's the weakest point. That's what's going to unwind first. But um, you know, you're going to lose a nymph. You're going to lose a nymph pretty quickly, anyways. So um, yeah, you if if you're using a lot of glue, you probably use it too much. Uh, will semi seal Canadian? I've dubbed work. I think semi seal Ed would be perfect. That's a nice translucent dubbing. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Olive. Well olive ed well if you use olive it's um it's not going to be a rainbow warrior it's going to be a ed's warrior uh how about an orange hot spot how about it roger sure try it try it this this fly does have a little red hot spot at the head but yeah you could put a put an orange hot spot on it what thread and color 
red thread and I'm using 12 O, but I think you could use uh, 8 O or uh, 70 denier for this fly. Um, I, I use 12 O a lot just because I have it in my bobbin and I can make a lot of wines and make a lot of mistakes that don't show with 12 O. And it's plenty strong for, for tying a fly like this. So I don't, um, I don't particularly worry about it, but yeah. Any other questions, Tanner? Thank you for highlighting those. When do you personally use this fly? Whenever I want to put on a nymph that's bright. I don't, I don't have any rules. That's for sure, Gabriel. Um, you know, you try them. I use it when somebody recommends a rainbow warrior to me, a guide or someone on the river, or I just use it to try it. Um, you know, there's no rules. There's no rules in when to put a particular nymph on because you can't see what's going on. You don't know what the fish are eating. You don't know what's going to appeal to them. Uh, sometimes something that's uh, totally unnatural like this, for some reason, the fish, uh, it appeals to the fish for whatever reason. Who knows? We don't know exactly how they see. Uh, looks like could be a good grayling fly. Yeah, this fly would be great for sunfish soon. It would be a really good sunfish fly. Absolutely. Be a, be a deadly, deadly fly for sunfish. Yeah. Three prong or two prong adapter for Patagonia. Oh, uh, they'll have them down there, Mark. <laughs> my, uh, my cohort, my cohort from our trip. Uh, to Patagonia is asking me. <laughs> Good question, Mark. But uh, he has adapters down there at the lodge. All right. Any more questions? We have have an international international audience today. UK and Germany. We're fishing for trout in Chile, Jacob. Uh, mostly rainbow trout and brown trout. I think there's some brook trout around, but um, yeah, yeah, Jerry. This I think it's be an awesome fly for sunfish because it's so flashy. I think it, I think it would be a killer. I think it would be a real killer. All right, last chance for questions. Here I am. We can. Do this live. Unrelated. Favorite base layers for tops and bottoms. Oh, that's an easy one. Uh, merino wool, Jacob. Absolutely merino wool. No, as far as I'm concerned, there's no other choice. You know, for for cool weather or cold weather fishing, my base layer is going to be merino wool every time. Uh How small would you tie this? John, I would go down, I would go down to, I would go down to a size 18. I wouldn't go any smaller, uh, but I, I'd go down to a size 18 on this fly, yeah. Or you, you could tie a 20, but I don't, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's needed. If I'm down, if I'm down to a size 20 nymph, I'm going to use something that's a little more imitative because if I have to go to a size 20, 20 nymph the fish are probably keying in on something specifically this fly is a great fly where when you when you don't know what's going on you don't know what the fish are eating you know they're going to see it <laughs> so um yeah and ed ties them on a jig hook very good it'll work very well on a jig hook in a dry dropper rig what would you fish this under um I'd fish it under anything that would suspend it, Roger. My, as you you probably know, my choice is a chubby Chernobyl or something like that. But you know, in a smaller size like a sixteen, you could hang this under a parachute Adams. Um, you know, a, a, a some sort of caddis fly with a fairly bushy wing. Um, you know, it depends on really. De it depends on on the time of year and you know what what I think is out there. Um, as far as dry flies, because when I fish a dry dropper, I, I'm expecting to get something on the dry at some point. I don't just use it for an indicator. So if there's a lot of caddis around. I'll use a big, bigger caddis fly. If there's, if it's summertime or fall, I'll use a hopper. 
you know, if it's spring, I might use a big stone fly. So, you know, you, but you got to have something that'll suspend the fly. You have to have something that's visible because it's your indicator and you have some, something that'll float well enough to suspend the fly. So generally a foam bodied fly or one with a lot of hair in it. What about using peacock curl for the tail instead of pheasant? Sure, John, wouldn't be a rainbow warrior, but it might be better. Who knows? And yes, Martin, this is more of a searching pattern. I don't, it certainly doesn't imitate anything I've seen. Uh, the fish may see it for something different, but yeah, it's a searching pattern, definitely. Yep. Yep. Wow, we have someone from Greece. Very cool. I tied on a size 16 hook and I'm tying more for fishing tail warriors in Colorado in midsummer. Yeah, Ed, I, for Colorado, I'd go 18s or maybe even 20s um, for that fly, especially in tailwaters. But I, I'd go as big as a, I'd go as big as a 10 or a 12 on a short shank hook on this fly too. And the, the, um, those you can tie with a great big bead uh, that won't slip over the eye, and um, you know, uh, you know, sometimes for an anchor to get your get a smaller fly down, just a big flashy rain, rainbow warrior uh, might be a good might be a good fly 20s works well as the tailing nymph with beaded on point fished on dangle okay thank you colorado fly fish okay it looks like we are out of questions so as i said i won't be here for a few weeks uh Two weeks. I think I'll be back. I think I'll be back. Let's see. I'll tell you when I'll be back. The ninth. Oh, the 12th. The 12th of December. I'll be back the 12th of December. So I won't be here. Won't be here next Monday, 28th, and won't be here December 5th. But I will be back tying on the 12th. And then we have a tie-off with Tim Flagler. Oh, I don't know if we decided when that is. Don't know when our tie-off is going to be in December. Anyway, all right, everyone. I hope you, uh, for those of you in the States, not you Canadians, because you don't celebrate Thanksgiving on the right day, um, I wish uh, all of you in the States a happy Thanksgiving and, um, and uh, safe travels if you're going to visit family somewhere. And thank you. Thank you all for tuning in today. Really appreciate your questions. And um, thank you for your uh, thank you for your well wishes. Appreciate it. And um, see you in a couple of weeks. Bye bye.